So, how many of you are ready to receive the word today? A couple of you? Awesome. Why don't we just stand one quick time, we're going to pray, and then we're going to dig right into the word today. Father, I thank you for this time together, Lord. I thank you that your word uh, it always transforms us. It has a purpose, and it searches the very thoughts and intents of our hearts. And God, we ask that you would transform us. I ask that there wouldn't be one person in this place that isn't touched by your word today. And all God's people said, yeah. amen, amen. And so... Um, the title of my message today is Outpouring, and I believe that as we move into 2018, we can expect an outpouring of God's Spirit, amen? And it's something that we've been praying for, something we've been believing for, and there's a promise of outpouring that is coming to Trenton, amen? And so um, what I wanted to do today is I wanted to look at um, an int interesting story in the book of Ezra. Now, this message is actually a message that... They actually did also in Kingston a few weeks ago. And as I was looking at some of their material and praying, I really felt that um, God is doing the same thing in this house. There's, there's a real outpouring that's beginning to happen in this place. And so let's look at this together. The word Ezra um, actually means the Lord has helped. How many know that God wants to help us? How many know that God's on our side? He's not counting your sins against you. He, he wants to see you prosper in all things. That's the heart of God. And he's here to help. And we see in the book of Ezra, the stirring of the Holy Spirit, six times he moves and he stirs and does a work in the people of God. And um, what happened in the book of Ezra is after 60 years in Babylon, the children of Israel were in captivity in Babylon because they rebelled against the commandments of the Lord. And if you study your Bible, you understand they were in rebellion so God gave them into the hands of the king of Babylon, and they were oppressed, okay? And so what happens is they were captive for many years. And sometimes we as the church, even though we're saved, even though God loves us, we're actually in captivity. And God doesn't want us to live in captivity. He wants us to live in freedom. And after 60 years in Babylon, the captivity that was going on, the Lord begins to stir the heart. Say, stir the heart. God begins to stir the heart of King Cyrus, who is the king of Persia, to issue an edict for all the willing Jews, not all whoever's willing, to return from exile and to rebuild the temple. 49,000 plus people leave Babylon. They go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. Okay? How do you know that God can stir the hearts of leaders? That's why it's so important as a people that we pray. We pray for our leaders because God can get a hold of leaders and begin to stir their heart to come alongside the church to bring revival. And we're believing that God can do the same today. Amen. Uh, first scripture I want to look at here is Ezra chapter 1, verse 5 to 6. It says, The heads of the fathers, the houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, and all whose spirit God had moved arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. I want to say this here, that all of you guys who are here, I believe you're here because God has stirred your heart to become part of the vision of what God is going to do in this house and in this community. God has stirred your heart. Some of you, a large percentage of you have got on board with partnership. And you're saying, listen, we're going together. We're doing a team thing. We're going to bring revival. We're going to see the kingdom of God come. And so, because why? Because God stirred your heart. And God did the same thing back there. He stirred the hearts of the people to build the house of the Lord. I believe that your hearts have been stirred. My heart has been stirred to build the house of God in Trenton. Amen. All of those who were around them encouraged the Jews with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things. Beside all that, it was willingly offered. And I believe that God is going to about to pour out favor on the church, where you're going to begin to see politicians and leaders and people in the community begin to give and say, hey, listen, build the house of God. We need something. We don't understand what we need, but we need something that looks like God. And, you know, we're just going to fund it. Just build the house of God. And I believe that God is going to begin to stir the hearts in 2018. Not only did King Cyrus send them with provision, but he took the stolen articles from the temple um, that had been taken to Persia. And he said, take all your articles back to the house of God. 
So here what happens is God stirs the hearts of the people. And then the second thing he does is they begin to work because their hearts are stirred. In Ezra chapter 3 verse 1, it says, The people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. It kind of reminds me of the book of Acts. The Bible says they were all together in one accord. They had one heart, one purpose. We're together because Jesus told us to tarry and we're going to build the kingdom of God. How many remember that? And so, so here we see the same thing. They're together as one people in Jerusalem. Okay? And it says before the foundation of the temple had even been built. Okay? They started worshiping God. I'm going to tell you this because even before revival comes in Trenton, we're a people that are worshiping him. We're, we're worshiping him even before the foundations. The foundations are being laid, but we're worshiping God because of who he is. We're not worshiping him because we want him to do something. We're worshiping him because of who he is. And even before, and the reason why they worship before the foundation was laid, because they could already see with their spiritual eyes the destiny God was taking them to. And we're a people of faith. Every one of us here, we can see in our spirits, if you have eyes to see, that there's a tsunami that's about to come over this land. There's, there's a move of God that's about to come to this community. And we have to see it with our spiritual eyes. And when we do, we begin to worship him as if it's already happened. We, those things that be not as though they are, because we see it. God's about to do something. You know, it's very easy to see all the negative things that are happening in the world. Amen. Like we look and we see, we know what the enemy's up to. We see the, you know, the car bombings. We see the, you know, the attacks and all of this extremism and all this stuff that's happening all over the world. We say the enemy, the enemy, the enemy. But what's God up to? And that's something that we have to set our eyes on so that we begin to worship him for what he's about to bring. Amen. In Ezra chapter 3, verse 11 to 13, they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever towards Israel. And then all the people shouted with a great shout. They shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundations of the house of the Lord was laid. The sound was heard afar off. When, when God begins to move by his spirit, there's a great sound that begins to come out of the church. Right? When they were in Jerusalem in the upper room, 120 people began to shout in unknown languages and began to praise God so that people all around said, what is the commotion? Amen? I'm British by nature. I, I, my, you know, I got British lineage. My mother would go back there. But God's not British. I figured that out. He wants, he, he's just full of expression. And, and when he moves, people just get emotional. He's French. That's right. No. I got some French in me too. So he's more French than he's British. But, um, but, but you see what happened was they began to praise the Lord because the foundations of the house of the Lord were laid and the sound was heard afar off. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You've begun to see even the last couple of years that there's been some foundation that God's been laying. And some of you, go, you're going to small group. If you're going to connect group, there's a sense of community. There's a sense of the presence of God. There's a sense of building. The foundations are being laid for a move of God. So there was a great shout. And when we truly get a hold of God, when we truly get a hold of the promises in, 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 that he has for our life, it can't be ignored. You're going to begin to shout. How many have ever been excited about something that God, you're either reading the Bible at home and God speaks to you and you're like, yes, that's for me. Or maybe, you know, some preachers up here, maybe I'm preaching something you grab a hold of. You say, that's for me. Maybe someone give you a prophetic word and you say, that's for me. But you need to understand, even though you're shouting and you're excited, you need to know that there will sometimes be opposition. Because the enemy doesn't want to see the promise of God fulfilled in your life. And so what the enemy does, he goes, oh, I, that person will be so dangerous if they get a hold of who they are. So I'm just going to send opposition to, to discourage them. That's what he does. His tactics never change. So opposition begins to come to the children of Israel from the non-Jewish inhabitants. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know, as a pastor for many years, 
I'd preach on Sunday, but I would work like a lot of you do in the workforce out there. And I, it's like you leave the island, you know, and you, you're all of a sudden you're being discouraged and, you know, you're in a workplace where people are putting you down and you can't be yourself. I know what that's like. And it, it's a sense of discouragement that can come against you. Ezra chapter 4, verse 4. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. And that's what's happening is that, you know, they're, there's trying, they're trying to discourage the church. People that don't believe in God. We want to discourage the church. But listen, they troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. The enemy wants to frustrate your purpose. But you still have a purpose. And you're going to win. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But we need to be aware that the enemy will come to frustrate us. And we have to be like the children of Israel. We have to do what they did. So what happened was, um, because of the mocking, the non-Jewish inhabitants sent a letter to King Artaxerius. I can't expel it, so I'm going to call him King Artie. So the non-Jewish people sent a letter to King Artie who commanded them to cease their building because of the enemy's mocking. And so the non-Jewish inhabitants sent a letter saying, you don't realize these Jews are going to rise up against your kingdom and they're, they're a threat to everything we are. And, and they made up all of this BS, right, about, about the children of Israel. And the king, right, he bought it. And he said, you need to cease the building. And that's what happens is, you know, we can, if we're not careful, we will forget the promise of God. We will forget the purpose of God. That he has spoken over your life, over your marriage, over your kids, over your church, and try to bring discouragement. So the people, what did they do? They ceased the building of the temple because they were told, you need to stop. And they got discouraged and they began to hang their head down. And you know what God had to do? God had to send a prophet. God sends some prophets. He sends Haggai and Zechariah to remind the people of God's promise under Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. And so this is what happens in Ezra chapter 5, verse 1. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophets, prophesied the, to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem, in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. And, and in order to counter discouragement that comes against the prophetic words, they went back to the original source, okay? And they, 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 they said, what are we going to do? We, God has spoken this, so what are we going to do? So they wrote a letter and sent it to the king, it's no longer King Cyrus, it's a new king. But he sent a letter to the king, all right? And he says, I want you, king, to go back to the original source, find a copy uh, of the letter that King Cyrus put a seal upon. And so the king said, well, okay, I'm going to go back. And so he went through his file cabinet, and he found a letter from King Cyrus. And it said, Ezra chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, Keep yourselves far from there. Let the work of the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of Jews build the house of God on its site. And the king also commanded the people to give provision both for the temple and for the salaries and for the offerings and for the worship. Because he saw, oh, wow, the king before me said they were supposed to build a house. I got to honor that. And so he let them begin to build what they were told to build. We have to go back to the word that God has spoken over us because he's not schizophrenic. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't say, I, I've called you to do this and to be this and then six years later go, ah, I changed my mind. He doesn't do that. You have a plan. He has a plan. You have a purpose. Amen? Is that good news? And so what is the end result? The, fin the temple is finished, Okay. The people are purifying themselves. They go through the purification process, and they're separating themselves um, from all the filth of the nations around them. Ezra chapter 6, verse 22. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, 
And the Lord made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria towards them. Again, God turning hearts. Say, God turns hearts. And when we pray, God will turn a heart. That's why never don't look at Prime Minister Trudeau and talk about everything he's doing wrong, even though he's doing things wrong. All prime ministers will make mistakes. But you need to begin to pray, God, turn his heart. God, turn his heart. God, touch his life. God, touch his family. Begin to pray, and God will come, and he'll move. Amen? And so they separated themselves. The enemy comes to, um, to bring discouragement. That's what the enemy does. He comes to bring discouragement uh, so that you'll lose heart. He wants you to lose heart, so he brings discouragement. He'll bring distraction so you lose the purpose and distinctives. He'll bring intimidation so that you lose your perspective and your trust. And I believe it's time for the people of God to choose who they listen to and rise up. And we need to be encouraged by God's promises. What does God say? I don't care what's going on around me. I understand bad things are happening. But what does God say about my situation? All right? I have to stay on task. I can't let the enemy discourage me. i got to have a focus to say, if God said it, I'm going to press to it. Every one of us have to do that. We need to trust God. And when we trust him, the fear will go away. Because we begin to put our trust in us. And, you know, here's, here's a scripture in 1 Peter 2, 9. You're a chosen generation... A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are, we are a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. And we're going to proclaim his praises. And so here's the question. God's temple must be built, not by strength, not by might, but how? By my spirit, says the Lord. As we move into 2000, next week I'm going to be doing, um, starting to teach on prayer. We're going to, we're going to go into a month of prayer. Uh, the second week of January is going to be a week of fasting and prayer. And we're going to begin to talk about prayer and so we can begin to birth and begin to grab a hold of the promises. I think we need to get together as a partnership, take all the prophetic words and put them on the table and let's just read them over and let's pray. Because God wants to f- bring revival He's, that has been spoken over this church, and we got to hold fast to that. So, yeah, we're going to see it. And we're going to birth that into the realm of, in 2018. Amen? And so we have to stay on task. Zechariah lived and prophesied under Zerubbabel, who was the governor of Judah. And he forbade them to trust in the resources of man. And uh, the responsibility to, to, has to be rebuilt by the Holy Spirit. In Zechariah 4, 6, this is the next slide. It says here, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And it's not going to be because of the worship team we have up here or the preaching that comes from here. It's not going to be because our small groups are running a certain way or we have a certain program working. Those things are all tools right, that we can use, but it's not by strength, it's not by white might, it's not by human strategy, it's, but it's by the Spirit of God that is only birthed through prayer, a church that sets their focus on prayer, amen? I want to give you a story, I was talking with a pastor a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was doing his service, and at the end of his service, he, he said he really felt to pray for the sick. And God spoke to him and said, I want you to call that woman up. So he pointed, there was a woman. He didn't know who she was. First time probably in the church. And he spoke exactly what the Lord said. He walked up to her and he said, "Um, do you feel that God could use you to heal people? She's like, no, I don't think so. He says, yeah. In fact, God told me to bring you up. So he takes his girl, brings her up to the front, stands her there. And then um, he calls up sick people. And so he said, anyone needs prayer, come up. So five people came up, and she prayed for each person. And they all got healed. But then she looked funny, and he said, what's wrong? And she goes, I have fourth stage cancer. 
And the Lord spoke to him immediately. He turned to her and he said, God brought you up here to show you that the same way he moves through you, he can move to you. And then he prayed for her and she went back and sat down beside her partner. After the service, he realized he didn't know who she was. She was in a lesbian relationship, living common law with this girl. And he's like, God, why would you tell me to do that? She's, you know, she's not even a Christian. She doesn't know the Lord. And you had me bring her up here and pray for people. And God said she was abused by men as a child, sexually. And I wanted to show her that I was going to unconditionally use her, not abuse her. So she goes. So the two couple, the couple keeps coming to church every week. And uh, she goes and uh, goes to the hospital. The doctor says the tumors have shrunk. So she keeps going back over a period of three months. The end of the three months, every time she went back, the, the tumors shrunk, shrunk, shrunk. And she was completely healed. They come to church. They both broke up, repented for a lesbian relationship. They got born again. And they're serving God in the house of God. Why? It's not by strength, it's not by might, but it's by my spirit. And God is going to begin to move, and he's going to begin to heal people, and we're not going to know what he's doing. We're just going to be preaching the word and letting him do his thing. Amen? And that's what I'm excited about. As we move into 2018, we're going to begin to see radical conversions. We're going to begin to see healings. We're going to begin to see miracles. We're going to begin to see blind eyes open. Why? I believe that this is the year of breakthrough. Amen? Amen. And so if we truly get a hold of his promises, we would, number one, here's what we would do. Next slide. We will pray persistently. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Not just occasionally or, or even consistently, but persistently. We have to be a people who prays, and, and we have to pray with passion. And we have to be persistent. Could you imagine in the upper room, they got together and they're, they're waiting for the Holy Spirit. I believe they were probably praying the book of Joel saying, Lord, you promised you were going to send the Holy Spirit in the, in the latter day. And they're praying the word and God begins to come and move. You know, we need to stop praying our will and start praying God's will. Amen. So the Bible is full of promises, right? And so we need to become a people that would get together and pray the promises of God, begin to declare the word of God over our situation so, till we see transformation. That's what God has called us to do. Many times we get together and we just pray. And sometimes we have prayer meetings where we wait for 45 minutes for God to give us something to pray about. No, we got tons to pray about. Let's get the word out and let's pray God's word into the situation and let's see transformation. That's what God is calling us to do. Learn to pray his will into the situation. Amen? The most effective prayer is agreeing with God through praying his word. The Holy Spirit will lead us and we'll begin to see transformation. God is good. Luke chapter 14, verse 23. Um, all right, the next one is, the next thing we need to do is we need to share consistently. We need to become a church that is consistently sharing our faith, consistently sharing the gospel. In Luke chapter 14, verse 23, then the master said to his servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them, come in that what my house may be filled. Remember, we're laying a foundation for the house of God. And that's what the will of God is. You know, it's amazing because the purpose of the power of God isn't for us just to sit around and enjoy it. How many know that? See, what happened, if you think about this, picture this in the book of Acts, 120 people in the upper room. The Holy Spirit falls, the power of God comes. And where did they go immediately? Into the streets to preach the gospel. And I believe as a church, when the power of God begins to fall in this place, as he will in 2018, he has in the past, but there's more coming. There's a tsunami coming. When the power of God begins to move in this place in 2018, it's not for us to stay here. It's to bring it into the streets. It's to bring it into your small groups. It's to bring it over to your neighbors. It's to bring it to people outside of this building. Amen? And when we do that, God will multiply it, multiply it, multiply it. 
and lives will be transformed. Acts chapter 1, 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you that you can be witnesses in Trenton. That's where we live. And the rest of the world, we, we are called to be witnesses. And that's what the empowerment that's coming is for, so that we can share the love of Jesus. We can model him. We can share his love. And that's what God is about to do. What started in the upper room went to the streets. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to bring it to the streets. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, it says, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith would not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. And I believe we're transitioning in a time where people are going to begin to have faith in the moving of the Holy Spirit in the church, not just some preacher who's preaching some babble that they learned in Bible college. Amen? Not that that's, there's nothing wrong with teaching the Bible, but there has to be demonstration. Lives have to be changed. And that's what's coming. The next thing we need to do is we need to live abundantly. All right? We need to live abundantly. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, and peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We need to live abundantly. And that's not talking about money. There's a lot of people that have a lot of money that are depressed. Because what they're, what they're trying to buy with their money is righteousness, peace, and joy. And guess what? You can't buy that with money. I, I would take righteousness, peace, and joy over money any day. It's, the, prosperity is not just about money. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. When the power comes, all of that comes with it. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in Say it together. Power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance that comes with revival. Living in the promise of the Holy Spirit is to live far more than what we see now. As we, God's about to do something powerful for his name's sake. When we get understanding and hold on to the promise that God has given us, we start experiencing the abundant life that Jesus spoke about. In John 10.10, 10, he says this, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that you might have life and enjoy the life, have it abundantly in the full till it overflows. That's the kind of life that God wants us to have. And so in conclusion to all this, like the book of Ezra, they had to come back to the original source. The original word that was spoken was, you can go now and rebuild the temple. They had to push away the discouragement. They had to push away, and they had to be a stubborn people. And they had to make a decision that, you know, we're going to persist. We're going to do. We have, how many know you have to be stubborn? You know, I heard a story about a farmer the other day, and some of you might have heard this, but he... He had this big hole dug in his field, and his, he was walking his donkey. The donkey fell in the hole. Well, he tried to get the donkey out, but the donkey was resisting, right? He couldn't get the donkey out of the hole. So he didn't know what to do. He said, he said well, I'll just bury the donkey. So he took the dirt and his shovel, and he put it on the donkey, and it landed on his back, and the donkey went, hmm, and he'd shake the dirt off. He didn't want the dirt on his back, so he'd shake the dirt off. He kept trying to bury this thing, and he'd shake the dirt off. And... It would, the dirt would fall, and the donkey would step on it. And the next thing you know, more dirt would come. It would fall, and he would step on it. And the donkey started to rise. The next thing you know, he's eye to eye with the farmer, and he walks out of the hole. So when the enemy brings discouragement, when he brings crap, when he brings all the stuff that would put you down, learn to be stubborn and just shake it off. And then step on it. And you'll rise up slowly. And the next thing you know, you will have your deliverance. Amen. But don't get, don't get buried under the discouragement. Don't get buried under the words that have spoken. Don't get, shake it off and you'll begin to rise. Amen. Say, shake it off and I'll begin to rise. That's the plan. Say, that's the plan. Shake it off and I'll begin to rise. And that's what God wants us to do. And so 
we need to be very stubborn. And so what I want to do in 2018 is I'm going to start going really a lot deeper with with the word. We're going to we're going to go deeper. Amen. But then I'm going to tell you guys and say, okay, for the next series, the next three or four weeks, we're going to do a series that is is specifically for getting people to come to Christ. And so those are the weeks you're going to bring all your friends because we're going to just bring it down so they can understand it. But we're also going to have series that are a little deeper. Okay, is that all right? Because we're going to we need to grow and we need to bring revival because God has spoken it and we're going to do it. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand? And I want to just ask this question, just get a show of hands. Uh, once every two months on a Sunday night, I would like to have a service on a Sunday night, which we will call a deeper night, which is just uh, a lot of uh, worship and prophecy and prayer and just Holy Spirit night. How many would go to that if we did it? Okay, got a bunch of hands. Good. Because on Sunday morning, as you know, Holy Spirit is always welcome. Holy Spirit's always moving. But we're, when we're teaching here and we're worshiping, we have to be sensitive to people that are coming from all different places. But I'd like to have a night where we can just let loose. And so I just wanted, and I saw a good show of hands. So we'll plan that as we move into the new year. Um, so we're excited. Father, I thank you for every person here today. I thank you, Lord, that as we take communion today, God, that um, we, we're so thankful for 2017. God, I thank you that even as I was preaching this message, you begin to you were putting your finger on people's hearts concerning words that have been spoken into their lives where they've allowed discouragement. And God, you want to resurrect those words, those prophetic words that have been spoken to them for 2018 is a year of victory for them. And I thank you, God, that you're speaking to our hearts today. Breathe on that by your spirit. And all God's people said, amen.